when I debate people, one of the most consistent set of criticisms I get are the twin sins of um, solipsism and nihilism. I get called the two a lot. And that's not an easy sort of charge, I guess, if you want to call it a charge, an, an easy criticism to defend yourself against. But as long as you're prepared for the fact that people are going to call you that, um, there's no reason to get frustrated by it. Um, you just have to consistently make your case. Dinah Cat Loves Me asked me um, a couple of in a couple of roundabout ways, um, or mentioned that he sees me this way, uh, but he didn't say it as a nasty thing. Um, and he said, I've never seen you argue a different case. Well, or at least argue a, a case a, a, in a similar way, but on a different topic. Well, I pointed out that I, have, I actually have done this before. In this case, I'm discussing value and the... Um, value that we can place on reality itself. Are the depressive realists realistic? Um, do they have enough information to make a value judgment upon reality itself? Or even reality relative to somebody else? Um, I'm saying that we need a fixed point by which to judge reality. That's an axiom. We need a fixed point by which to judge value that fixed point is an axiom. We have to remember that those are axioms, that those are not solid facts, that we conventionally judge value certain way. Um, Pyro mentions a number of ways in which he judges value. And <coughs> we conventionally judge reality in certain ways, the scientific method, empiricism, etc. Disprovability. Um, conventionally, yes, these are useful tools. Have we established anything real? No. Um, so we can't jump to conclusions or draw sweeping conclusions about the nature of reality itself, its value or its reality, the, how real is reality. We can't really do that. Now, I only got sort of my hand forced into looking at things this way simply by a bunch of assertions that were placed in front of me as a invitation to a debate. This is reality. Reality is, if you look at it dispassionately, depressing. Um, I understand that that's not all that depressive realism says, but um, a lot of people are interpreting it that way. Okay, so now I have to either take the opposite point of view, i.e. reality is actually a lot more cheerful than you realize it is, but that's not what I'm going to do. I'm, or, or I'm going to say, let me have a look at those assertions that you've made and what you've based them on. That's the tack I'm going to take. Now, this can bother some people because it's, it has the effect of irritating your, what you call them, supporters or um, the people on your side of the debate, I guess, just as much as it will irritate the people that you're debating against. Because a lot of the people who actually apparently are on your side have just as many assumptions that they've taken as reality as anybody else does, as your opponent does. <clears throat> so no, we don't have enough information to say that this is concretely what reality is. Um, and that's the only way that we can place value on reality itself. Even relative to reality. Relative to what? Relative to each other or whatever. It, all, it always assumes that there is a fixed point which there may not be. Um, or even if there is one, there's an infinite number of ways of perceiving and or explaining it or expressing it. Um, now, I mentioned a Rushton earlier on, and the, the way that I came at Rushton's point was quite different from most other people, I simply said, okay, you're saying that, vaguely, roughly speaking, Asians are more intelligent than white people, white people are more intelligent than black people. That's sort of a, I don't know, pigeonhole of his idea. There's a lot more to it than that, but anyway. Um, instead of trying to prove that everybody is just as intelligent as everybody else, I simply said, okay, you tell me what intelligence is. Good luck, because we only know what intelligence is axiomatically. 
We've agreed upon it, and Rushton has exploited the fact that we've forgotten that we've just agreed upon what intelligence is, and we've we've now taken intelligence to be a solid, unarguable fact, and he's run with it in the same way as, say, a depressive realist uh, intellectual type who was interested in promoting the idea uh, would do the same thing with his point of view, his idea that here's what here's how we gauge value, and this is where it leads me. Rushton simply says, here's how we gauge intelligence, and this is where it leads me. And what I say is, you're just saying here's what we gauge as intelligence, and you're not questioning it anymore. Well, I'm going to question it. I'm going to question it hard. Because again, these two implications have serious consequences, I guess. Uh, saying that reality sucks, you know, can <laughs> lead to nasty things like, oh, I don't know, depression, <laughs> suicide, uh, alcoholism, um, all kinds of nasty things, giving up on life completely, but dragging yourself through life as a, I don't know, a crack whore or somebody like that who just sees no value whatsoever in human existence at all. And not only that, there is no value, and there can't be any value. That's where depressive realism uh, strikes me as, I won't say a dangerous idea, but an idea with consequences that people don't want to fall into. Um, people don't want to fall into a depressive habit of thinking. Or at least they don't want to fall into it accidentally, which I think most people who do end up suffering from depression do. It's not something that they seek. They don't say, oh, I think I'll go and uh, make myself as depressed as possible. It's it's just, oh my God, I've just discovered this really horribly depressing truth. I don't know how to deal with it. Oh, it's probably right. Now, that's where people often ha end up in depression. <clears throat> that's how I ended up in depression. You just sort of stumble across it. And that, that's the consequence of an unchallenged um, intellectual point of view that pushes axioms to an nth degree. A lot of people look at what J. Philippe Rushton has to say about race and intelligence, and they say, you know, based on all the studying I've ever done about intelligence, this guy is right. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, looks like we have to revisit everything that we've ever thought about in terms of public policy, in terms of um, human rights, everything, based on this new discovery. Because look, his case is unarguable. Well, I uh, think that his case is very arguable, and again, I'm taking the tack of um, go after his axioms. We can't measure what intelligence is. We can watch what other people do, and we can evaluate what they do, and we can listen to what they say and evaluate that. What's going on in here is completely unknown to us. <clears throat> we don't know whether or not somebody is intelligent or stupid. We can see what they're doing and say, I don't understand why he's doing that. But we can't say that it's a smart or a dumb thing to do. Uh, based on all the information that he's got, and this is a kind of a, what I would, I guess, call um, a cognitive form of determinism, he couldn't have done anything other than what he did because all of, like everything that we ever do, like the present moment for all of us, is basically our entire past behind us preparing us for what we're doing in the next couple of seconds. Everything that has ever acted on us, ever, has created reasons for what we do next. Okay, Now, I apply that to intelligence. Everything that this bonehead does that we think is not a very intelligent person, his entire lifetime of experiences have prepared him for what he's going to do in the next couple of seconds. To him, it's not stupid at all. To him, it's the most rational, reasonable thing to do. In fact, it may be the only thing to do. Um, and it's not because he's stupid or his mind isn't uh, working correctly. It's just that the assumptions upon which he has built absolutely every aspect of his decision-making uh, apparatus has militated towards what he is now going to do next. All the information that he has tells him that the, the his next move is the either the only possible move or the only 
intelligent move. Even though somebody else might be looking at that person and saying, what a complete and total dolt doing this. Um, makes no sense. But to him it makes sense. Or he wouldn't do it. <laughs> um, so you've got to be careful with axioms. And you've got to be careful with people that are willing to challenge them. There are some people out there, I guess, who can come across as trollish simply because they, they like to just sort of challenge everything and laugh at people for, you know, scaring people into, you know, saying or rather frightening people with, see how shaky your thinking is? I'm making the universe dissolve before your eyes. I'm not trying to do that at all. What I'm trying to do is just see axioms for what they are and use them for what they're useful for. Axioms are extremely useful tools. They're useful servants. They're to be put to use for our purposes. But we can't allow ourselves to be ruled by them. We have to revisit our axioms, or else we are beholden to our own creations. And that's crazy. We, you know, uh, That's the old story of Frankenstein. Uh, you create, or, or the, the, the child who accidentally summons a, a demon or a genie. Um, what if the genie disobeys you? Well, um, that's the trap of depressive realism. And I have argued this way before with different ideas. Um, just ideas that I find particularly, I won't say dangerous, but particularly problematic for some people. Um, in the case of depressive realism, I think that, as I say, depression is something that people stumble across by accident. And a lot of the arguments uh, that they use for defending their depressive position to, are to be found in depressive realist thinking. Where I find it, I guess I could use sort of guardedly the word dangerous, is the fact that promoting the idea of depressive realism is not the same thing as finding it convincing. And promoting it is what forces me to back up and to go after the axioms. Um, Axioms, again, are servants. They must not be allowed to become our masters. <laughs>